So thank you everyone for joining us. I am Marina Bonanno and I'm the graduate program manager for the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University. And we are going to hopefully answer your questions on our MA and PhD programs. I'm going to be joined in a few minutes by four of our current graduate students. And I'm also assisted tonight by Craig Saxon, who directs our communications. Next slide, please, Craig. So just a brief history on our program. We're one of the oldest and most prestigious informatics programs in the US. And you may know that informatics is a relatively new field and its members tend to know one another. So uh, it's a close knit community and Columbia is a big part of it. We are located on the Uptown Irving Medical Center campus and we are one of several coordinated PhD programs within the biomedical sciences of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So I have included here some URLs for your information on our PhD program, our MA program, our curriculum, and our research advisors, which tend to be the areas where we get a lot of questions. So I hope that uh, if you haven't had an opportunity yet, that you will be able to take some time and look those pages over before you finish your application. Uh, you should also know that uh, with regard to our, our PhD program, that you will have an opportunity to receive two master's degrees en route to the PhD, one of which is actually the MA, Master of Arts, and the other is the Master of Philosophy. Next slide, please. Another question that people have is what happens after I apply? When do I find out if I am going to receive an offer? So the application deadline is December 1st and PhD finalists, if you're going to be interviewed, it would take place at the end of January. And then offers of admission are issued by the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. The department makes a recommendation to the Dean for finalists whom they've interviewed who they want to admit. And uh, the Dean issues offers in March. So the important part of this slide, in addition to just the deadlines, is that I want you to know, regardless of what program you end up applying to, that Columbia is one of many institutions that adheres to the Council of Graduate Schools April 15th resolution. And what does that mean? It means that if you receive an offer from Columbia or from another institution that is a part of that council, you will have until April 15th to make your decision as to whether or not to accept or decline if they offer you funding. And Columbia fully funds its PhD students. Next slide, please. So I wanna just give you a bit of information about the differences between the MA program and the PhD program because sometimes people are not sure which is the appropriate program for them. So you have the same application for the MA or the PhD program. It's an identical application. You need to apply by December 1st for the PhD program because those are the programs that are uh, required to meet certain deadlines of review. But for the MA program, you will have latitude to apply after December 1st if you're not able to get it in by that date, simply because we have to review the PhD applications first. You'll also have an opportunity within that application to list the MA program as your second choice if you wanted to list our PhD program or another PhD program within the biomedical sciences 
at Columbia as your first choice. The only thing you can't do is you cannot list the MA program as your first choice and one of the other programs such as ours, that's a PhD program as your second choice, that's not allowed. But you could certainly list your MA program as your second choice. And so if you were not offered a, a slot in the PhD program, you could be considered for the MA. The MA program, you're, you wouldn't be interviewed, you're interviewed for the PhD. And the MA program has the latitude of, you can attend full or part-time, your time to degree takes 18 months up to four years. And so the PhD program, it takes longer simply because of the research that you're doing. In the MA program, you do a master's essay, whereas in the PhD program, you do a dissertation. You are able to apply for the PhD while you are an MA student. Uh, but the time to degree to the PhD does not necessarily get shorter if you were to obtain your MA first, simply because it, it, the time to degree is, is largely dependent upon how much time it takes you to finish that dissertation uh, with your faculty advisor. And then the PhD is fully funded by Columbia, as I mentioned, whereas the MA program it is self-paid. So you can apply for financial aid through the university, um, but the university does not provide full funding for the MA. That's only for the PhD. Next slide, please. The application requirements themselves, this is the nuts and bolts of applying. Our program still requires GRE or MCAT scores, and you would send those to the Graduate Affairs Office. TOEFL or IELTS scores are also required. There are minimum score requirements, and those numbers are on our website. There's a personal statement, and uh, the main point with the personal statement is it's very short. So one of the challenges is maybe fitting everything in there. What I offer for advice to prospective students is focus on if you've done research experience, certainly highlight that in the statement, but also remember to include within it why you're interested in Columbia, why you're interested in our department and program, what research you would like to do and which faculty members you'd like to work with. And there are there is a page of research advisors who work with students on our website. You also need to include transcripts, but you don't need to send in official transcripts to the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences unless you are admitted. So you would just upload unofficial transcripts in the meantime to your application. And be sure to include any scores on the application itself when you fill it out. Next slide, please. So I encourage you to visit our website for additional information. We have videos there on our training program uh, that Craig put together for us. They highlight the breadth and depth of resources at Columbia. There are testimonials from alumni and faculty and current students. There's application information. There's pages on the current research and working groups and labs. And then certainly there's listings of our faculty, staff, students, and alumni, if you would like to get a hold of any of us. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna transition to our incredible students. They are in their third and fourth years of our PhD program. And they are working out of different labs in our department. We have Andina Gisla daughter, Amanda Moy, Harry Reyes, and UA Sun. And I've included here their email addresses, but you can also find any of us from our web pages. I wanted to start out with some questions that we already received. If each of you could please tell us 
your area of study in informatics, what lab you're in, your undergraduate and graduate major, and what research you're doing. I guess Undina, oh. you can go first. Yeah, okay. So hi, I'm Undina. I am in Nick Tatnevi's lab doing, focusing on translational research. Um, my undergraduate degree was in biomedical engineering. And then I also got a master's in biomedical informatics. And yeah, so we actually did a lot of COVID research this past year using electronic health records. Uh, we do a lot of drug safety research um, and yeah, stuff like that. <laughs> it, was there something else? I, I forget, but I think. Oh no, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Amanda, help us out. Um, I'm Amanda, I'm a fourth year PhD student in Dr. Rossetti's lab. My research mainly focuses on clinical informatics and using um, EHR metadata to evaluate uh, documentation burden in electronic health records. My undergraduate, I have a triple major uh, from Penn in, I can't remember, it's been so long. Um, Hispanic studies, biological basis of behavior and anthropology. And I also have a master's of public health uh, from Mailman in epidemiology. Um, and I think that's it. You can ask me more about it later. Thank you. I, I wanted to, uh, of course that happened. <laughs> I wanted to ask y'all if you would please put your questions in the chat. And, uh, you know, depending upon how many there are, you could also try and raise your hand after we go through the first few questions, because we, we definitely want to be able to, to answer whatever questions you have. Um, Harry, please help us. Hi, everyone. Uh, Harry Reyes. I'm a third year PhD student in Noemi El Haddad's lab. Uh, primarily, my research leverages machine learning and natural language processing to improve the equity, safety, and quality of healthcare, as well as generally just scientific discovery, discovery in medicine. Uh, I'm especially passionate about using and expanding the vast toolbox that computational learning offers to better understand, improve, and facilitate the study of health in underserved communities. Uh, so a lot of health equity projects, essentially. Uh, prior to coming to the program, I received my Bachelor of Arts in History and Sociology. Uh, not all of us study computer science, though some of us do. Um, and uh, prior to that, I also received a Master of Applied Science from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So I come from a public health background. Um, and once again, I think that's all of the questions. Did I miss anything? You did a stand-up job, Harry. <laughs> Thank you, Marina. Marina is our champion. Uh, all of all the students in our program. We love Marina. Thank you. It's mutual. Yi Wei, tell us how wonderful you are. Um, <clears throat> hi, um, I'm Yi Wei. So I'm a third year PhD student. I'm working Dr. Harris Swan's lab. So I mainly do um, research on the biological side. So I'm working with gut microbiome. Um, both used in the well lab techniques and also the computational techniques to, <clears throat> to study the um, associations between diseases and gut microbiomes. And you may notice Harris one is not in the research advisor list, but um, I think that's the um, flexibility of our program. So if you find some research advisor that you are really interested in, you can approach you can, you can always approach and do rotations there um, and just work with him or her for your dissertation project. And my background, um, I had a degree in microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics from UCLA. And <clears throat> yeah, and I did not have any masters. Thank you so much. Another question that we had received is what is some advice you'd make for someone who's trying to decide whether to embark on a PhD program? If uh, we could start with you, Yibei, since you, you went last. 
Sorry, could you repeat the question? Or what, what's some advice that you'd give to somebody that's trying to decide, should I do a PhD? For instance, you, you're one of the students who did not come to us with a master's degree first. So, you know, what, were you, what made you decide to apply to the PhD versus mm -hmm. the master's program? I see. I think I think it depends on like what you want to do in life because pursuing a PhD is takes a lot of effort and, and a lot of people they might struggle during their PhD. So I did research during my undergrad to confirm that I really love research and I want to do research um, for a living. So that's why I applied to the PhD program. But like if you prefer uh, like making money afterwards. You can leverage whether like an MA degree is better or like a PhD degree is better. Excellent. Harry, how about you? What made you decide to apply to the PhD after getting your master's? Uh, so I'd worked in research for quite a while. I applied to the program as an older candidate, let's say, um, with uh, over a decade of experience working in public health and clinical research. And essentially what it came down to is that I wanted to be the master of my own destiny. I wanted to pursue very specific research questions um, and lead those projects uh, as a principal investigator. I'd like to become a professor in the School of Medicine or just generally at a university within a biomedical informatics department. And uh, in order to do that and pursue my own grants, I needed a PhD. It was also an opportunity to uh, pursue a very concentrated, engaged uh, learning um, and uh, pursue a specific topic uh, for a concerted uh, period of time. Uh, so uh, I would say if you love research, you, sh you should definitely get a master's or a PhD in the topic. Uh, if you want to pursue your own projects with your own, you know, pursuing your own research questions, a PhD is definitely the way to go. Um, and it's for folks who are interested in academia as well as industry. Thank you, Harry. Amanda, what made you apply to our PhD program after getting your master's degree? I guess I can echo what um, Harry said. I came in as an older student and I've worked in, uh, in this, this order, research, uh, local government, and then industry. And I wanted to go into academia and pursue my PhD to have a little bit more autonomy and freedom in the projects that I work on and be able to choose what Harry said, um, the research questions that um, I'm interested in. Um, and I like the creative process of academia. Um, so I think those were the main reasons. I also love um, teaching, um, which is what brought me back and having um, additional training to be able to pursue that also as a, as a secondary path. Um, but it was to build on top of what I've already learned in epidemiology and, um, and you know, data science and biomedical informatics is really expanding. So there's like a, a a change in the tide of where research is going. So it, it was to um, kind of like improve my skill set. Good, Amanda, thank you. Undina, what made yeah, you I, after your master's? Yeah, so I, yeah, I'm gonna echo what everyone else said. <laughs> Basically, I actually, after my undergraduate, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to do my PhD or master's, but, you know, PhD was always in the back of my head. Um, I guess, you know, I grew up thinking that I wanted to do that. Uh, but then during my master's, I fell in love with the research. So I was like, yes, I can definitely commit to a four plus years of doing research. I think that's probably the main difference between the master's and the PhD. Like there is a larger time commitment, um, but, but yeah, you're, I think it's one of the more exciting places to be. You're always at the edge of innovation. You're always thinking of how to solve really relevant and
Well, I, I chose Columbia. I mean, I'm also very biased because I had um, I had completed my master's of public health at Mailman and I knew that um, and Columbia is very interdisciplinary and you're able to take courses at you know, public health or computer sciences. Um, and Columbia, as you know, Harry mentioned, one very important thing is to know that you're fully funded because it reduces the stress of um, the PhD program because the PhD program can range as Marina had mentioned between four and eight years. Um, and um, I'm biased towards New York as an older student because I think that it's important to not only focus on your research um, but also on your personal life and to be able to do things to relieve that stress. Um, and um, yeah, it's important to select faculty who match your interests and um, know that the program that you want has the resources to, you know, fulfill what you want to do in the future. Thank you. Yi Wei, why Columbia? Um, so my my reasons are much simpler. Um, so first, I think Columbia has a great program. So it allows you to do rotations, to do um, two or three rotations, or like even four rotations. So if you know your area of, of interest, but you don't know like the specific professors that you want to work with for your dissertation, you can rotate in their labs and that gives you the flexibility of um, like trying out which lab and which professor works with you well before deciding um, who you who you want to work with for, for five years because that could be a lot. So I like that program um, and also I love my like interview experience. So during my interview, like I chatted with a few professors and chatted with my fellow applicants. And um, I think everyone is nice and, and Marina is very nice too. So I think I can thrive in this like environment with nice people. So I think that's important because without um, support from your fellow graduate students or or support from um, the staff, it could be hard to go through five years if you encounter any problems. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I, you know, one of the URLs that I believe Craig had put in the chat that was on one of the slides are these testimonials from our students and, and our uh, faculty on, on Columbia. And, uh, and I think that what Yi Wei is speaking to is um, you, if you are so inclined, community can be very important in terms of just having a, a base of support to have a cohort of people that you're going through it with and who um, uh, want to help each other. So I, I would encourage you to, go to these programs or, or get as much information as you can, but ultimately feel where you feel like it would be a home for you, where you feel like, you know, it's a place where you can thrive. And uh, my role is to help the students, but even before the students make their decision, I want everyone to find the place that is appropriate for them where they uh, feel the best. And so, my, uh, my goal is not necessarily that you decide to come to Columbia, but that wherever you're looking at, you get as much information as possible to make the most informed decision that's best for you. Because this is your life that you're building. These are your hours. This is your time you're going to spend. So you may as well make a life that is whole and rich for what you want in, in your future. Um, so thank you, all of you, for that. And the, the final question that I had received before we open it up to ones in the chat that I'm not answering offline is what is the culture like at Columbia? Yue, let's start with you. I would say it's more like a work hard, play hard culture. Uh, like sometimes we spend a lot of time working 
but we also have our like personal lives like chilling in the new york city or like hanging out with friends um and i think um the culture here is also very collaborative so like you can talk to um people from other lab um collaborate talk to other pis talk to your community members um yeah so i think it's uh, collaborative and supportive excellent Lindina. yeah i think i would echo what you i said i mean I actually remember meeting each person from our cohort during the interviews and everyone, I just immediately, we bonded so quickly. And then when we all joined the program, like we have a group chat that's DBMI family, like we're so close. <laughs> and we all celebrate each other's wins so much that I think that's like one of the things that I love about the department is you have, you're surrounded by amazing people who want you want to see you succeed. And um, yeah, it's very welcoming. During the interview process, also the faculty were so friendly. Uh, they wanted to hear all about you. And uh, yeah, I think collaborations is also very good. It, everyone's very friendly, very smart. And so it's like exciting because you're just, bouncing ideas off each other and you're having a great time and it's a great environment. <laughs> Thank you. Harry? Uh, so along the lines of what everyone has been saying, it's a vibrant collaborative culture filled with extremely intelligent, talented, creative, highly motivated people uh, who are also very personable. Uh, so one way that I think this is demonstrated is that our chair, George Ripsack, uh, has this policy that everyone goes by their first name. Uh, so a lot of that hierarchy that is often found within academia uh, is sort of put to the side. Um, and we just talk to each other as human beings. It's very respectful. Um, and uh, this, this collaborative uh, interdisciplinary, so biomedical informatics by uh, definition is, is an interdisciplinary field, and so it very often requires collaborating with people with various uh, types of expertise. Um, and so because we have a, a wealth of diversity within our department, uh, we're able to pursue very interesting projects as well. Thank you. Amanda, what is the culture like at Columbia? I mean, I think Marina is the culture, which is amazing. <laughs> um, I think, well, I like, you know, it, like everyone said, it is a very collaborative environment and also everyone, all students are supportive of each other. And I think that could be kind of like a rare occurrence in like PhD programs where some of them are extremely competitive. But I find myself still talking to a lot of the alumni who have already graduated and then they're really helpful in walking me through all of my milestones and supporting me through everything to make sure that I'm successful and just reassuring me that, you know, what I'm experiencing is kind of like a universal experience. Um, so I, I agree with everyone that I think Columbia is an anomaly where it's just a great place to work with other students. And uh, we try to be as social as possible um, for example, uh, we just came back from AMIA and usually it's just one huge party uh, and a huge reunion. Um, and what is yeah, AMIA? we try to- what, what does AMIA oh. stand for, Amanda? Uh, it's the annual symposium for the American Medical Informatics Association. So every year it's uh, the conference is just a huge reunion um, among uh, informatics professionals and researchers um, and essentially it feels like we were discussing this the other day and it just feels like a huge homecoming or a reunion and um, it's just nice to see everyone and everyone just loves each other. It's, it's just a great place. It's in a huge party. So, um, I mean, there's research, but then there's also, you know, we try to come together and, um, you know, play, um, you know, do 
social events and you know one year we went x throwing what do we do this year we just had like a what do after the retirement disco not yet <laughs> oh we're planning a silent disco so um we try to have fun so Amanda and Undina are the PhD student reps. And so they uh, plan events with funding from the department for our um, entire student body. Uh, and so, you know, no one's twisting your arm, making you participate, but ax throwing, come on, come on. And they wouldn't even let me go. True, true. So when they say, you know, that they're doing it for the students, they actually mean it. There are no chaperones, unfortunately. So um, thank you for your answer. Um, if, you know, if any of you have additional questions, please, you know, put them in the chat. I, um, I know that a question had come in about asking about our, our requirements and the TA in. And so, yes, you do have to TA for two classes and we ask you in the spring, you don't have to TA your first year. Um, maybe uh, Harry, you could talk a little bit about your experience as a TA and was it you know, manageable? Was it horrible? What it was, was wonderful, it, it was wonderful. Uh, I, I do love teaching. I actually, full disclosure, was a teacher for a year after college, uh, New York City Teaching Fellows. Uh, but even beyond that, uh, I really enjoyed my experience. Uh, it was an opportunity to uh, delve a little bit deeper into a topic. I taught uh, introduction to medicine and clinical informatics. It's essentially like a mini med school boot camp, uh, but very approachable. Uh, and uh, you know, I I think it was a, it was good to get that experience of uh, teaching members of my cohort. Uh, it's what else? Um, in the spring, what I'll be teaching is, or, or sorry, TAing teach, as a teaching assistant uh, is a course on ethics and justice and digital health. So a very different type of course with Noemi El Haddad and the chair of bioethics here at Columbia, uh, Sandra Sujin Lee. Uh, so I, I re I'm really looking forward to it. Um, anything else? Medina, you're currently a TA right now, right? Yeah, I'm currently TA in the translational bioinformatics course, which is taught by Professor Tatnetti. And it has, it has, it is actually, uh, I think open to undergraduates as well as masters and PhD students. And it's actually taught on the main campus. Um, but so far that experience has been great. I also, <laughs> I also love teaching. I actually was a TA for a lot of semesters or a lot of different courses before I came here. And it's just something about helping people get like, someone said they had a light bulb moment today and it's just so rewarding. Um, it also, teaching a course will make you learn it so much better. So next semester I'm doing computational methods and yeah, I'm, I look forward to testing my knowledge because, you know, you're going to get questions that you haven't maybe thought of and it'll test your knowledge and it's a great experience. You learn a lot more from it um, and you get to know more people in your program, which is always a plus. <laughs> anyway, I, I have a question here about um, research rotations. And so I know you had mentioned one of the draws for you was being able to do research rotations before you chose your research advisor. And you mentioned how at Columbia, you're able to choose advisors who aren't necessarily within the department because it's interdisciplinary and collaborative. So could you say a little bit more about that, you know, that experience? How was it that you selected who to rotate with? And if you looked at other programs, where they don't have that model, um, what was it that you know uh, drew you to the lab that you chose? I see. <clears throat> so when I uh, came to Columbia, I have like m multiple areas of interest. 
So um, in my undergrad, I did research um, on human genetics. So um, that's one of my interests, but also um, I had my degree in microbiology. So um, I'm also interested in microbiology and gut microbiome. So I wanna explore um, these different areas. So I rotated in uh, labs that do very different research projects. So I think um, from there, I was able to decide like which lab is the best fit for me um, and whether I would still want to do human genetics or I, I, I'm like confident enough to venture into this new field of um, microbiology for me. So, so I think after my um, rotation, I'm like, I feel like um, the lab I'm currently in really empowers me to do like more research, to do like deeper uh, research into microbiology. And I feel like I'm capable of doing research in microbiology. So um, I think that's um, how the rotation programs helps me to make my decision. And also I know, um, for some other institutions, you cannot do rotations. So you have to choose some, a research advisor before you join the program. Um, I don't really like that because I think it's important that you talk to the students um, in the lab you want to join before you make the decision and to really experience um, how, how well you work with the PI. Do you like his mentoring style? Is he like more of the micromanaging style or is he more hands-off? I think a lot of things can play a role in, in like whether you would succeed in your PhD. Um, <coughs> PhD. So, so I think um, I really benefited from this program. Thank you. So, you know, just just in case uh, people didn't understand um, in terms of the slides that I did, um, you're, you know, uh, you are not tied to a lab when you come in. So, you know, while it's helpful for you to state which uh, labs you may want to join or which research is of interest, because like uh, Yiwei was saying, you know, she had various areas that she was interested in, as I imagine, you know, a lot of you do. Um, even if you put that in your personal statement and then you come here and you learn about a faculty member that's not in the department and you decide to do a rotation, there is still a path for you to do that. Um, and so uh, whatever you do in terms of applying is not, um, is not uh, set in stone. Once you get here, there is a lot of flexibility for what lab you choose. Um, so there is a question in the chat as well about uh, knowledge and research experience in computer science and uh, whether you have to be in a specific DBMI track. Um, if you have to have research experience or computer science experience, uh, because I know some of you are a few years out, but when you apply, there was those things, those tracks, <laughs> and you could put no track, but what does it mean? You know, like what, once you get here, are you, you know, limited if you aren't necessarily um, a, a CS undergrad? So if, uh, if Amanda, if you could start us off answering that. Yeah, I think that dovet dovetails nicely to uh, what you had just mentioned about, um, you know, what you express interest in when you first apply and what happens. So I can explain how I went through the process, which was completely organic, and I'm not doing anything that I had anticipated that, that I would be doing. So initially, when I had applied, my background was in public health um, epidemiology, but I'd worked in um, on systems for like HIV re reporting um, in the city. Uh, but when I was working in the industry, most recently then, I was working on systems for like adverse event reporting. Uh, but my essay had focused on public health informatics and building systems to identify um, you know, pandemics prior to it occurring, which is kind of ironic because now we're in a pandemic. But um, when I came, I, I had selected Columbia because 
of the flexibility and I knew there wasn't that pressure. There was the ability to explore. So when I came in, I actually rotated with, um, with a, in, uh, with a professor who was more computational, which was um, Adler Parat. Um, and my focus was on adverse events. Um, but um, then I rotated with, um, with um, Sarah Rossetti and her, her background is more in like the documentation burden, data quality, and uh, what is entered in, you know, the, uh, how the EHR impacts, um, how clinicians experience like entering data. And um, because at that time I was taking the informatics, the medical informa um, intro to medical, is it acculturation to, um, was it medical informatics? Programming in statistics or acculturation it's a savant, to- Acculturation, it's a savant's class. Okay, acculturation to uh, biomathematics. That was and the science I paid. Yeah. Um, so because I was taking that class, I really loved the whole uh, issue about documentation burden. And that's how I got into documentation burden and evaluation. So completely different path. And my background what, coming into the program was mainly epidemiology methods and also biostatistics and some big data. But my programming skills were mostly focused on um, statistical programming. Um, uh, and uh, I didn't have a computer science background, but I think it's easy to level up once you get on. Um, so I mainly use SAS data, um, SAS data and sometimes SPSS um, and other tools like S SQL. Um, but if you have, you know, lim at least some knowledge of programming, you'll do fine in the program. Like you don't need a really deep understanding of computer science, but I, I think I can, you know, you can ask another student what their experience was. Yeah, I think I could also add a little bit to that for like your questions regarding the different tracks um, and also the background knowledge needed. So if you don't have a strong programming background, there is a course, an in, intro to programming course that you'll start with. If you have a programming background, you can opt out of that course. You just have to like take a little assessment. Um, so, and then the different tracks, you'll take mostly the same core courses that should cover all of the important parts of biomedical informatics. So once you graduate from the program, everybody you know will have a very strong background in all these fields, no matter which track you choose. The only difference, I, the biggest difference I would say is if you choose the bio track, then you don't have to take a research methods course and you take a bio course instead. Um, otherwise, the tracks are pretty loose. You can choose a faculty that is not necessarily in your track, um, but that's kind of how I would view the tracks. They're very, flexible, but if you want to take a bio course more than the research methods course, you can sign up for the bio track. If you are interested in research methods, qualitative and quantitative research study designs, that's more research methods. So that's translational and um, clinical informatics. Uh, and then also there's the translational bioinformatics course that you can choose to take if you're interested in the translational track. But the tracks really, once you're done with courses, you don't really notice the difference, I, I would say. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so that's my two cents on that and the background knowledge needed. Thank you. Could you I, all say something about, oh, Harry, did you want to? Uh, yeah, I would just add to that, that informatics is a very big umbrella. And very often uh, at times we might perceive it as one thing in particular. So for example, right now machine learning is very big. So folks may sort of conflate what informatics is and what machine learning is. Uh, there are a lot of people who focus on machine learning in our department. We're very strong in data science. There are also people who focus on qualitative methods. Uh, every student who comes through our program has to have some foundation in each little area. They do that through the core coursework. 
for example, research methods like Amdina mentioned. Uh, you also have to take a computational methods course, which everyone goes through it. Some people are more computational versus others. We all level up together. We all bring our own respective strengths. Uh, I remember when I was applying, you know, I had a statistics background, but not necessarily, you know, fully machine learning or especially natural language processing, which now is an area of focus for me. Uh, so I would say it's perfectly natural to some, have um, some concern about your level of skills. Uh, I would I would worry less about that and focus more about the opportunity to strengthen any skills while when you get here. Um, and uh, I would also say that uh, you should have some exposure to informatics. That would be great, especially if you're going to sign up for something like a PhD. Uh, but I would also say sh share that your area of focus can change and morph. And uh, Amanda has sort of talked about that a little bit. I came into the program thinking I was going to do X. And I think I'm, I'm sort of within the same lane, but that has evolved over time. And I think that's a testament to the program too. If you leave thinking exactly the same way that you entered, the program has probably failed you. Uh, I think my knowledge, exposure, uh, perception of the field has evolved over time. Uh, and the types of questions that I, I study and the methods I use to do that have evolved as well. Thank you, Harry. Could, could you all um, say something about our relationship with the New York Presbyterian Hospital? And you know, do you find that to be a draw for you in terms of your research and the resources that are available to you? Yi Wei, can you start us off? Yeah, so um, since I work on a bio site, so for my lab, we have a lot of collaborators from, um, from the New York Presbyterian Hospital. So <clears throat> we have a very exciting or like rare samples that we can process and analyze. So I think that's definitely a draw for us. Like I don't really um, use the EHR data, but like, but I do collaborate a lot with the physicians from NYP. Um, yeah, and, and I, think, I think that's a good thing. I know like at some other institutions which don't have a strong collaboration between the um, biomedical informatics department and the hospital. So they don't really have um, access to the um, patient data or like patient samples. I think I think having the access is great because like NYP is one of the top hospitals. So we have like, I mean, in terms of patient um, samples, we have um, like a lot of rare diseases and a lot of um, patients. So I think I think that's a very good resource that we can study. Thank you so much. Would anyone else like to answer it? Can yeah, I think um, I would like, yeah, mostly my research is using the electronic health records, which honestly is very exciting to me. I think um, we have over 6 million patient records or something like that. And dating all the way back to like 1980. And then during COVID, New York was hit first. And so we got all these, you know, COVID electronic health records data that we were able to analyze. And we got a lot of requests for collaborations because essentially if you're in a department that doesn't have such a strong or direct link with a hospital, you, you kind of are dependent on collaborations to get access to that type of data. Um, and then, you know, you're kind of bound to like the interest of that collaborator. But when, yeah, this is actually one of the reasons that I came to Columbia. Um, yeah, using electronic health records is really cool. And we have a lot of, we have like Odyssey and almost common data model. We have a lot of great tools to analyze electronic health records. And a lot of our research is around that because we're at such a unique position. Um, I think, yeah, that's kind of <laughs> how I feel about it. 
I would just add to what Undine is saying. I'm in the clinical track as well. Uh, well, Undine is in the translational track. I'm in the clinical track, but we use the same data. Um, and uh, she mentioned Odyssey. It's the Observational uh, Health Data Science Informatics uh, Program. Uh, and basically, it's a large federated data network across the world. Uh, and George Ripsack helped build that. He's the chair of our department. Craig, who's on the Zoom today, uh, works on communications for that. Uh, so that's a really wonderful opportunity because what we can do are network studies. So what I might do is use the EHR data at Columbia to develop a package that extracts uh, various data elements, uh, analyzes those elements, and then I create a pipeline that can be shared with other sites across the world. And essentially, because we have the same data model, it's called OMOP, it was helped in part developed by people through Columbia. Uh, we're able to do that. We're able to scale our studies uh, tremendously, you know, across the entire world. Uh, so a lot of really wonderful studies have come out of that. I encourage anyone to look into it. O H D S I Odyssey. Uh, we love our. We often refer to our pro projects in terms of Greek names. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's a fun uh, time. Thank you, Harry. Um... We're, I'm, I'm going to call last call for questions. So I, I just see that uh, another one came in here about the systems bio. So I'll answer some of it and then I'm going to pitch to you, Yi Wei, to, to answer some of it, okay? Um, so a question is how many spaces are reserved each year for each track? And I would, I would just say that um, that's, I believe that might be how integrated uh, the integrated program of which system biology is a part, does their admissions because they have various tracks within systems biology. So they may make a certain number of offers per track, but that's actually not how uh, our department does admissions. Uh, the way it works in our department is, you know, people look at the applications, there's a committee, and then there has to be a consensus among the faculty of these are the people who are going to get the offers. Um, so there isn't a, a, a set number of how many tracks get a certain number of offers in terms of the evaluation piece. Um, Yi Wei, could you, could you say a little bit about if you, uh, if you have a sense of what differentiates those students versus the students in our department who happen to be doing a bio track? Because I can talk about it from the you know, the faculty or the administrative side, but I think it's interesting to hear from the student perspective. Yeah, so I think, um, so both programs have bio tracks and a lot of the faculties, they overlap, they have cross appointments. So um, I think the main difference is the classes you take and um, whether you TA or not, and also um, the course, are different. I mean, the um, qualification exam are different. So for my program, um, even if you're in the bio track, you are you're still required to take some of the medical informatics classes that can like increase your knowledge in the biomedical informatics field. Um, while for the integrated program, the system bio track, you only take classes that are related to um, to like biology or computational biology. And um, for, for um, biomedical mathematics program, you are required to TA for two semesters. And for the integrated program, you are not required to TA. Um, and the course um, for, for, for our program, the course you have two calls um, at I think I think one is during the second year and one is during the third year. So so for our program, we have a depth exam and also a breast exam. So you take the breast exam first, um, which examines whether you have a good grasp of the different fields and the classes you take. Um, and for the depth exam, you do like a review and like a Q&A session on the research topic that you're interested in. 
and for the integrated program, the call is different um, because they require you to do a proposal um, based on your research project. So you would um, propose three aims and you um, have to like, um, do like a QA and a session with your committee members and um, they will decide if you would pass your call or if you need to take another class to increase your knowledge base. So I think that's the main difference in terms of like the research you do, it's totally up to you and up to your PI. Um, and, and of course, sorry, one more no, thing. Go ahead, so, go ahead, go ahead. So like, so like, um, the last thing is that depending on which program you're in, like you make friends with um, the, the people in your program. So like, so I think our program has like the nicest people amongst all the programs here at Columbia. So I think that's definitely like a good, um, a good thing you want to consider. I, um, I'm so proud of all of you. You did such a wonderful job answering these questions. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, with regard to that last question, and I agree with you, uh, Yue, just in terms of the, the differences that you articulated. So I would encourage you to also, you know, look at, and I, I can't tell from the question here if maybe one of the part of it is, well, how many offers, if I put, if I put my bags, if I put my eggs in this basket, you know, like what are, are my chances better if I do it within biomedical informatics or integrate it? And I honestly can't tell you because I, I do not know how many offers they make for each track in the integrated program. But I feel like the information that Yiwe gave you, it, it is substantive and it, it gives you a sense of there are curricular differences there are, you know, certainly faculty differences, although, you know, potentially, even if you applied to integrated, you could work with the faculty who are in, you know, a systems bio through our department um, and the and the quals differences. So how does that translate into time to degree? I don't know, um, but I would encourage you to look at the courses and see because sometimes the feedback that we get from our alumni who do the bio track is that based on what they decided to do taking those classes within biomedical informatics, which were part of the core and that led to their first preliminary exam ended up being so helpful to them subsequently in their career. And if they had done. Something that you need to think about in terms of the differences that might help you to make a decision which one to apply to. But to just circle back to my first slide or one of my first slides. You do have the option within the PhD program, since both of them are within the coordinated PhD programs in the biomedical sciences, you could put us as your first choice or integrated as your second choice or vice versa. The only caveat is that um, sometimes it's, there is no guarantee that the second choice program is going to still have slots by the time the other program gets your file. That's the only thing that you don't know. Um, from year to year. Um, but if there are, oh, there is a, a question from Amanda Moy. No, I'm just kidding. She's just adding a clarification. Um, so if there are no other questions, oh, there is another question. What are some fun things that went on in DBMI during the COVID times? And I hope this is not an oxymoron. Right? Were there any fun things that went on in DBMI during the COVID times? Undina. Um, well, my cohort, we had like a weekly catch up Zoom, uh, which definitely helped keep you sane during this pandemic. Um, and then our lab played like some Among Us and stuff. <laughs> um yeah I don't know we and then during like the last parts of the pandemic we were able to hang out outside or if you're vaccinated um so yeah we were able to get dinner and um 
spend a night in New York together. <laughs> I think that's, yeah. Yeah, and during COVID times, when everything was shut down, we decided to do all of our uh, DBMI student socials online. So we had a few game nights, a few virtual um, virtual happy escape hours. Escape the room. We did escape room, which was really, it was really fun. <laughs> um, and what else did we do? I think we, there was like a joint social with Stanford with, with like Grubhub. Um, uh gift certificates and we did the um the real dv there was the real deep learning which would just it was just a fun thing that we did where we featured um <laughs> a student every month and uh, marina was the host and we just asked questions like we presented like from birth to like current like what the student's story was <laughs> um and everyone got to ask questions and there was a there was like a quiz and like prizes and uh, what else do we do? I, I seem to remember some trip to the um, least popular borough. Oh, we went to Staten Island, yeah. We went to, um, so there was a student, an MA student who had graduated who wrote um, a play during the pandemic um, called Staten Island Musical. And we all went there and we watched them perform it and it was actually amazing. And it's gonna be off Broadway, I think, right, Harry? At some point, it will be off Broadway. Yeah. <laughs> that student is currently in medical school right now after getting his MA. Uh, Sal Volpe, he's amazing. We all have secret talents. We do, and we try to ferret them out as much as we can, but you know. So I. We were limited as to what we were able to do because of the restrictions, obviously, on gathering and uh, indoors, but there was still a, an interest in trying to have some sort of community, even if it was virtual. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, the student reps do a great job at trying to foster that. Yeah. We also got care packages, which was really nice. Uh, it definitely brightened my day in some dark moments, so I really appreciated it. Yeah, we definitely got creative during COVID on how to stay connected, but it worked out well, I would say. Yeah. So um, if there are no other questions, you may reach out to us at any time with your questions. And we really appreciate your participation this evening. We look forward to reviewing your application um, and uh, and our contact information, if you came in late and didn't see it on the slides, it's on our website. So, you know, feel free to contact us. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>